Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us and I would like to welcome you to our Articulate PD Health, Health Equity in Australia today. So, um, before we begin the webinar, on behalf of all presenters, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize the continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nations and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country in which you're, you are and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. As we share our knowledge today, teaching, learning and research practices within the university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. All right, let's get started. So this is just an overview of what the of how the webinar will be structured for today. So I'll do a little bit of cow skipping and then we have Dr. Catherine Kenny doing a little bit of an introduction and then the presentation by Dr. Kelly Burns followed by the presentation from Imogen Harper and then Dr. Kristen Davis will also give a presentation and then we'll do a Q&A and evaluations at the end. If you do have any questions you can pop them in the Q&A function on Zoom and we'll be answering them at the end of all presentations for today. Easy, so um, as I said, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and also the event will be recorded today and we'll be sending it to everyone who has registered um, by next week and also we'll be adding it to our articular webpage as well. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at um, fast.partnerships at sydneyedu.au. All right, these are our speakers for today. So we have Dr. Catherine Kenny starting shortly. Katie, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, so it's my real privilege to be able to kick off our webinar today on health equity in Australia today um, and to lead this really fabulous panel of speakers from across a whole bunch of areas of the university. So Kelly's from the School of Education and Social Work. Imogen hangs out with me here in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And Kristen's over in the Faculty of Medicine and Health um, out at the Clinical School at Westmead. So when I started thinking about putting together something around health equity, which is a concern quite central to my research, being in a um, research centre devoted to healthy societies, my go-to was actually the Society and Culture Syllabus. And I was sort of looking through it and realised it wasn't actually in the Society and Culture Syllabus, it was in the PDHPE Syllabus. And it was on the one hand surprising to me, but on the other hand, I think it speaks volumes about the fact that health equity might be a particular part of a particular syllabus in an HSC curriculum, but it's an issue and a concern that matters to people across a broad range of disciplines, areas of society, jobs, futures. And I think you can really see that in the range of places that um, the speakers from today come from, their range of backgrounds, their range of titles, the range of interests that sort of we all have. So you'll get to hear a lot more about that as we go along. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to do today is to include a little bit of interactivity. And so as you would have heard from Joyce, um, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A throughout the presentations. And we'll come back to um, some questions at the end. But we're hoping also to embed some interactivity um, into the presentations today. And we're gonna do that through this Mentimeter platform. So what you're gonna do is I'm sure you've got your phone um, not too far away from you at the moment. If you wanna scan that QR code or you can go to the website and actually just enter the code, I'd love to hear from you. What interests you about health equity? What is it that sort of piqued your interest and made you come along to today's um, webinar? Now, there are no right or wrong answers to this, really. I'm just hoping that someone will pop something in the um, something into the app and we can make a little bit of a word cloud from it. So um, I can see there are a few people entering the Mentimeter platform. So go ahead and see if you can pop something in there. You'll have to scroll down to submit, 
to be able to make it pop up. There you go, general interest. Social justice is an HSC option, absolutely. Um, as we said in that sort of PDHP curriculum, but also sort of relevant across lots of areas of the curriculum. So as we go along, hopefully more of you will feel comfortable to jump into that Mentimeter. Let's see, inequity for ATSI peoples, and Indigenous health issues, rural, remote, remote. These are really good answers and actually speak to the next question I'm going to ask you as well. So what do you see as some of the biggest sources of health inequity today in Australia? So when we talk about health inequities, um, we're really talking about all of those contributors to somebody's health outcomes that really exceed the individual. So the circumstances that people are born into, that they grow up in, they live in, they work in, the opportunities they have as they age, um, what kind of systems that are in place to provide it for health and illness. And of course, how these are really all shaped by our broader social, political and economic systems. So socioeconomic status right here is a big one. Access to facilities, especially in rural remote communities. In a country like Australia, the rural remote divide is a particularly stark, as is the sort of um, gradient between health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous populations. So on that note, often we hear about health outcomes at this sort of aggregate average level. So if you ask people in Australia, how's your health? What's your health like? For On average, 46.5% of us will report that we enjoy very good or excellent health. But that's an average that doesn't apply to everybody. So I'm wondering if you have a sense of how that figure varies from the poorest 10% of the population up to the richest 10% of the population. So what percent of the poorest people in Australia say they enjoy very good or excellent health versus what percent of the richest 10% of Australia say that they enjoy very good or excellent health? So you've got a couple of options down here. Take a stab and see if you can Okay, we've got we've got 50-50. Can we uh, can we get some more responses and say, oh yep, okay, so now we're still evenly split. Can we tip the scales? Okay, 15 versus 78. Does anyone else want to weigh in before we move on? All right, I won't leave you hanging. It's actually 33% versus 60%. So the richest 10% of Australia enjoys um, a very good or excellent health at more or less double the levels of the poorest 10% of Australia. And that's the sort of a really sort of quick but powerful demonstration of one of the health in inequities in Australia, the sort of social gradient that we see in health outcomes. So you're going to hear a lot more of that in our next presentation by Kelly Burns, who's a senior lecturer in the, as I said, in the School of Education and Social Work. So I'll pass over to you now, Kelly. Thanks so much, Katie. Hi, everyone. And I, I want to say, because PDHP is one of the areas that I work in, uh, excellent choice in choosing to take this as one of your HSC options. And um, also, great choice in coming to this webinar. <laughs> and um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the idea of historicizing health equity. And in order to do that, I want to achieve four key aims for this presentation. So I first want to establish how the content of this entire webinar links to your stage six syllabus. And then I want to introduce the idea of the sociological imagination, um, both to think about the work that I do, but also I think it'll resonate with the other presentations as well. And I wanna ask why history matters to health equity and inequities. And then I want to explore the historical milestones around the idea of health equity to sort of unpack this concept historically. 
And then if we have time together, I would like to have a look at some sort of just brush stroke around my research, which explores the intersections of public health and schooling. So in terms of the stage six syllabus, many of you will already be able to identify and think about where this links. And in particular, I think it links to core one, health priorities in Australia. And I'm thinking specifically about the content around groups experiencing health inequities, preventable chronic disease, injury, and mental health. And also, of course, the extensive discussion around health promotion and the Ottawa Charter. Um, and then many of you will have the pleasure of exploring option five, which is done so very well in a lot of schools by so many fabulous teachers, many of whom you will be being taught by. And obviously the entire, uh, the, the key critical questions in health and equity all focus specifically on what we're talking about, as does the content in various ways. Okay. And all of you will know um, and have sort of established in your course probably already the difference between health equity and health equality. So when we're talking about, I love this image, and I'm sure some of you have seen it, but of course, equality is about giving um, individuals or people, particular communities or populations, equal resources or access. So the same amount, whereas by contrast, equity is about adjusting that access or resourcing based on individual need or the needs of specific groups or population. And I think you know that that's fundamental to what we're talking about today. So this idea of this so sociological imagination is really central to the, the teaching I do around health. And the idea of it is, is that it's a specific way of thinking about the world that is characterized by a willingness to think critically beyond our own experiences and to challenge the common sense or obvious explanations about human society, human behavior, and to that I would add human health. And when we use our sociological imagination, we, or we see the world through a sociological perspective, it's about making links between private or individual troubles and public issues, okay? And in doing that, we think about historical factors, the way that the past influences the present. We think about cultural factors. And significantly, we think about how structural factors intersect with historical and cultural factors, and also about the, the critical elements that are required to improve or overcome the inequities created by these historical, cultural, and structural factors. Okay. And when I think with my sociological imagination, or I invite you to, I'm, I'm asking you to rethink health as a, as a concept that we already know, and instead to adopt something like Kelleher and McDougall, where they say health is far from an uncontested, neutral, objective, or scientific concept. Rather, it is contested, and it is always involves considerations of values, ideologies, and power. And I, I like I just love that. I could write that up on, on my wall and, and keep it because I think it's a fabulous quote. And when we think in terms of Kelleher McDougall and think sociologically about health, we also acknowledge that health inequities, they're not natural or unavoidable or unamenable. Okay, they're, they're products of inherent social disadvantage and the disadvantage experienced by some individuals or groups is the result of how our society functions or, or fails to function equitably. Okay, so when I think sociologically, I also say history matters. I think about historical factors and more and more in recent years, I've been really interested as someone who works in health education to think about all of these foundations that I use and teach with where do they come from and what bodies of knowledge govern them and what practices in schools have come to make these sort of natural or normal? Okay, and so why does history matter to health research and to the research around health education? Okay, so I've just listed a few and you might have others you want to think about or add. Well, because meanings and values around health shift over time. 
Okay, another is that the social, economic, and environmental conditions that shape the health of populations, they're not just products, obviously, of our contemporary circumstance. They are part of a historical continuum of decision-making, policy, and practice, both in health, but also in other um, social institutions, including schools. Health, uh, sorry, history matters to health because historical events, governmental regimes, and approaches to care shape contemporary policies, practices, and absolutely our current inequities and inequalities. And the examples you, you raised in the poll that Katie had up demonstrates your understanding of that. Okay, H history really is a determinant of health. So when we talk about the social determinants of health, we should add to that list that always comes up on all of our graphics, history that history is actually a determinant of health and it helps us think often about not just the causes of ill health, but the causes of the causes of ill health or inequities. Okay, and history sheds light on the roots of present day health disparities and help, helps us address those. It allows us to understand changes or progress around health, so that's an important part of, of public health is acknowledging what has changed and what progress we've made in how we manage health inequities, but also um, in how we've improved technologies and, um, and, and health care. But also it allows us to think about enduring uh, gaps and disparities. Okay, and also I would argue that there is a value in studying history as it relates to public health because it allows us to think critically um, about our field and the bodies of knowledge that we draw upon within that field. And one really good example, I think, of changing values around health is cigarettes or smoking. And I love these ads from the 1920s, 30s, um, sorry, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, in which cigarette smoking is, is associated with leisure time, with good health, with uh, celebrity cultures, and with middle-class prosperity. And this, of course, sharply contrasts to our, the types of public imagery and values around cigarette smoking, um, where it's obviously associated with very grim imagery and with um, a lot of uh, social um, guilt and worry. Um, but also, um, now we've extended this to, um, to, to vaping, where we have lots of sort of focus on the negative health impacts of both smoking and vaping, but also we've started to think about, hang on, well, what are the implications for planetary or environmental health of cigarette smoking or in particular vaping? Okay, so shifting values around health across a historical continuum. Okay. And this term that we take for granted, health equity, well, probably if I ask some of you, when did it start, you might think, well, it must have something to do with the Ottawa Charter. Well, it absolutely is a founding principle of the Ottawa Charter. But actually what we know is that this term um, originates from the early 19th century, from the field of social medicine. So that long ago, key thinkers were trying to address social and class um, in inequalities in health and access to health and good health. Key things I want to stress is that in 1946, the World Health Organization Constitution stated that the highest standards of health should be within the reach of all, regardless of race, religion, political belief, and economic and social condition. Soon after, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights tries to set out a standard for what it means to, to um, access e equality or human right across all nations, how that could be measured. And what they state in that declaration, and we often don't think about this, is that they, they actually say everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family. Okay, obviously of its time, it's a gendered text, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so these declarations are already grappling with issues of equity and inequity. And then, of course, I can keep going, but we have in, in the 1970s, we see this sort of thinking about inverse, the inverse care law, which is saying that people who um, basically, like Katie's slide, that um, those who need 
resourcing the most are least likely to have access to it. And then um, again, we've got the um, Alma Ata Health for All launch um, in the same year in the 1970s, the late almost into the 80s, where inequalities are being clearly defined. And then in the 80s and 90s, we had this sort of these critical health scholars who are saying, and, and policymakers who are saying, hang on, these terms are being conflated in equity and inequality, and we still haven't gotten it right. And so you see this period into the 2000s where uh, major declarations take up equity as a, a cornerstone of the thinking. And certainly in Australian policy, health policy history, health equity in the last, you know, in, since the 2000s has played a major role and has a major focus. Okay, so with a few minutes left, I just, I think this is really interesting because we all go to school, right? But what we don't think about is what role has health always played? So actually since the inception of mass schooling, which is like compulsory schooling, there has been concern about children's personal and social hygiene or health. So initially concern was about the sanitary conditions of a school, was the proper plumbing, was the proper light for students so they didn't, you know, go lose their vision and was a proper quality air. These were huge concerns. But then we see this sort of shift that takes place around concern about the child's body with mass schooling. Okay, and at the end of the 19th century and well into the 20th century, school hygiene programs and medical inspections took place. So today I filled out a form for my child to have his eye inspection done at preschool. And I was thinking to myself, this all dates back to the well, in New South Wales, 1912, when we started sending doctors into schools to inspect children, their eyes, their spines, various aspects, their adenoids, so on and so forth. Okay, and what we see is that schools become this important site of intervening in the health of children and young people, but also of families and communities. Okay, and what I want to just quickly highlight to you is that while these, this history is very important to improving the health of children, it also was not completely innocuous. So the values around uh, public health in schooling were underpinned by values of um, Christian morality, class and assumptions um, about race and certainly around um, tied to the colonial project or to, and, and to, the, to, to um, some of the values around cultural genocide um, come echoing in, in some of these um, documents. So I want to just show you, this is an outline to the scheme. So if you, were, if you were a teacher in 1909, you will have received this in your gazette that you got um, every month. And it is an overview scheme of instruction. So what we call now syllabus or curriculum on how to teach hygiene and, and temperance, okay? And they overview it in terms of the home, the person eating and drinking and illness. And what's significant is that they detail this um, outline scheme and they give specific instructions to teachers about how to teach it and one thing is the assumptions around childhood is we've got to keep this really simple because kids don't know a lot okay and I think all of you would challenge that idea so keep it you know avoid too many technicalities but there's these specific instructions about who to teach how and I've got a quote here that is basically from if you are teaching in a poor district it's important that you supply this because this knowledge around good health and personal hygiene is not getting taught in the home. Whereas children from good families in good neighborhoods, so you can hear that, my timer going off, they, they'll get that. So we needn't do too much work there. Um, but we strongly must intervene in the homes and lives of children from so-called bad families. Okay, um, and so I think th this really illustrates going back to Keller and McDougall, that health is always contested and imbued with values and it shows the significance of looking um, to the past. So I hope that wasn't too quick. I'm really happy to hand this over to Imogen Harper so she can show us some of her um, just fabulous research that she's doing. Hey, great, um, thank you. Kelly, um, so I'm a second year PhD student at Sydney University, and I'm going to be talking to you about the research that I'm currently in the middle of. And I guess 
I want to preface this all by saying that what I hope to do with my research is create space for the experience of chronic illness in childhood and young adulthood. I think in many ways this experience is minimised or neglected by a whole variety of factors. So stories of what life as a young adult or as a child should look like, narratives about how young bodies should behave, and also medical scripts that tell us what illness should look like and which often suggest that being illness-free or finding a cure to illness is what our constant aim should be. So when I'm thinking about... So when I'm thinking about these experiences, I want to think about what the experiences can tell us about our social and medical relationship to health, illness and disability. Use that to in turn ask how we can all come to terms with what is sort of an inherent fact, which is that our bodies are vulnerable. And then finally, use that to provide support for people who do have these specific health needs. So before getting into how this relates to health priorities or the health of young people and also health equity, I want to go back to asking those um, sort of interactive questions to help establish the context of my research. So this first question, it's imagine you're in a co-ed class of 200. How many students are living with a chronic physical health condition? So I'm not including mental illnesses here, but I am including things like sort of mild to moderate asthma or food allergies, uh, along with potentially rarer conditions. So if anyone um, yep, has the chance to put in some answers, got the 50-50 split. If anyone else wants to go, now <laughs> would be the time. Um, but yeah. So, so it looks like you guys are on the right track. The answer is 60. So about 30% of people are living with something. So let's move on then to the second question, which is imagine that same group of people in their 10-year school reunion. So they're sort of 27, 28 years old. How many of those people are now living with what we might consider to be a rarer condition? So not things like mild to moderate asthma, things more like autoimmune conditions or serious chronic pain, brain inju injuries, um, those sort of conditions. Cool. So it looks like a lot of you are sort of on the right track and the answer is 20. And so what, what that is to say is that you know, it's not every single person you meet who is dealing with a chronic illness or a chronic health condition, but it is, I think, a largely a large and significant portion of general samples of groups of people. And it's interesting because I actually hesitated to put these statistics in my talk because I don't mean to suggest that we should only consider this experience of illness as important because of the numbers. So I do want you to know that, you know, odds are you know a young person who is living with a chronic illness, but that's not the only reason that we should care about this experience. So what I do in my research is speak to people under 30 who live with these sort of range of conditions that we consider to be rare, even if they're in some ways not so rare. So that's autoimmune conditions such as MS or Crohn's disease, people who live with persistent fatigue, challenging cardiovascular symptoms, or um, chronic pain such as migraines that affect them for over 15 days per month. One thing that I often hear from people I talk to is that they feel like they can't really talk about their life with chronic illness without either being dismissed and not believed, or alternatively, being labelled as struggling and overly concerned with their illness. And more generally, the sense is that young adults have not been given the vocabulary, especially while they were growing up, that allows them to explain their experiences or communicate their needs. So the three themes that I want to discuss today in relation to chronic health conditions are, first of all, the sense of frustration that arises when a body, let's say, misbehaves, and then relatedly, the protracted process of getting a diagnosis that then they have to go through. Second of all, the tension of wanting to have an illness or health condition recognised and understood, but not wanting to perform as a sick person or feel the need to constantly talk about illness. 
And finally, the way in which structural inequalities shape interactions with care and in particular medical institutions. So first, I've done about 20 interviews and there hasn't been a single one where people haven't talked to me about the frustration that comes from living with a chronic illness. That frustration is both internally focused and externally focused. So externally, what I mean is that the process of being diagnosed with a chronic illness and then living with one is frustrating in the way it makes you relate to frustrating things. So it's frustrating when a doctor dismisses symptoms or tests come back inconclusive, or you have to cycle through different medications before finding something that works. And that's a major and serious source of frustration. It's also internally frustrating though. And what I mean is just, it sucks to be sick or in pain. And even though a lot of the research I'm going to talk about today is about the way in which these experiences are made worse by institutions, I don't want to suggest that or deny the sort of living reality, which is that when our body is telling us that something is wrong, it's not a pleasant experience. But if we focus on this sort of external frustration, what we see is that it can be frustrating dealing with the systems and institutions that surround illness. So dealing with GPs or specialists or emergency departments or special considerations. This frustration needs to be recognized, not just to validate the experience, but also because it has consequences for how we interpret healthcare statistics and the diagnoses which individuals may or may not have. So the first thing I want to communicate is that epidemiology doesn't capture this experience necessarily. So first of all, many chronic health conditions take a long time to diagnose. I think here one of the more famous statistics is that it takes on average seven years to diagnose endometriosis, but many other conditions, for instance, many autoimmune diseases also take many, many years to be diagnosed. Adding on to that, there are also a number of situations where you don't receive an official diagnosis at all. And then without an official diagnosis, it becomes very difficult for especially young people to sort of formally admit that they are struggling with things such as pain or with things such as fatigue. So young people might be day to day learning how to manage their life but this frustration of dealing with doctors, especially when they have a difficult to diagnose condition, ends up not being worth the time, emotions or money. And so it simply doesn't appear on statistics about the kind of health conditions that people are dealing with. And it's also worth noting here that these frustrations directed towards sort of medical establishments often mean people turn to complementary and alternative health services. The final note about this frustration is that the sort of day-to-day -day processes that people undertake aren't even necessarily seen as things that ill people are doing and are actually seen as things that a super, super healthy person is doing. So for instance, you see a young person who tries to get a lot of sleep or who often doesn't drink or who you know exercises in a really intentional fashion and we assume that person is healthy but actually that person is managing a serious health condition. And despite the fact being able to do those things in some ways is a privilege, there's also real frustration with not being able to make choices about how you live your life. So the second theme I want to talk about is this tension between wanting your symptoms and challenges to be recognised, but not wanting to that recognition to diminish your sense of independence and capability, which again, particularly when you're sort of young and going out into the world for the first time, is like a, a really important rite of passage and potentially a sore spot, for instance, with parents who aren't willing to give you that independence. And I, I apologise for, for the fact that the formatting hasn't quite import imported correctly. But I want to note here that this tension, or at least the extent of this tension, isn't inherent to the experience of chronic illness. And it's a product of the fact that people are surrounded by friends and family and acquaintances who don't know how to give these young people what they need. So it's parents who are trying really hard to help their kid be healthy or cured and end up isolating them, or friends who don't really know how to properly make their activities inclusive, 
or acquaintances who talk about like wanting to be really busy or sort of glorifying a stressful culture, which is extremely alienating to someone who can't partake in that. And I think the best way to describe the result of this is this feeling of lack of space for the experience of chronic illness. That is, there isn't space for a young person who is learning to live with illness rather than for a young person who is sort of bouncing between the binary of healthy and sick in the way we might expect. So the final thing I want to talk about explicitly is the way in which the inequalities in healthcare manifest. So this happens at every point in the chronic illness journey. So when getting sick, we don't always know exactly why people get sick, but things like chronic stress, whether that's from things like trauma or, for instance, never being able to get better because you don't have access to medical care, means that you are more likely to develop these complex chronic illnesses. At the point you do develop them and you're trying to get diagnosed, once again, we see inequalities defining the experience. There's medical bias against women and gender minorities and racial minorities. There are also barriers to communicating with doctors if, for instance, the doctor perceives you as not sort of knowing what you're talking about, whether that's because of a linguistic barrier or an educational barrier. And on top of all of that, it's extremely expensive. So you're spending money basically to talk to doctors who might not be listening to you. And in many cases, the only reason people can advocate for their diagnosis is through educational privilege or having been taught that they're someone who's being worth, someone who sort of deserves to be listened to. But even if both of those hurdles are sort of jumped over and you get the diagnosis and you start engaging in care, there are still these sort of systemic inequalities. That's continued investment of time and money because it's very rare, increasingly rare to find people who bulk bill, especially when you're dealing with these complex chronic illnesses, which require you to have ongoing relationships with specific doctors. And also to the extent that management is things like scaling back on work or study or family commitments. These are other types of care that are not sufficiently um, that, that, that are not available to everyone, especially if, for instance, you have a lower socioeconomic status or you live in a particular um, area where things like just driving hours to get to doctor's appointment is an extremely fatiguing activity, which is the last thing you want to do if you're dealing with this chronic illness. So I hope that that gives a sort of outline of the way in which these inequities appear in a group of people who are often not talked about. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Kristen Davis for the final component of, of this um, presentation. Thank you so much, Imogen, for a really fantastic um, presentation. That was really wonderful. So um, my name is um, Kristen Davies and my pronouns are she and her. I'm a senior research fellow in the specialty of child and adolescent health in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. And I'm going to be speaking today about how to um, best maximise your impact to address some of the inequities that my colleagues have been speaking about today. So what is health advocacy and what is the role of a health advocate? Advocacy for health is a deliberate attempt to influence decision makers and other stakeholders to support or implement policies, and I've added, and practices that contribute to improving health equity using evidence. And that's really important. So um, alongside all my, uh, my colleagues, um, one of the things that we do is, is generate evidence by doing research. And advocacy should always also support people with lived experience of health inequity to speak and to self-advocate as appropriate. In public health, advocacy can be used to overcome major structural as opposed to individual barriers to public health goals. And some examples of that might be inadequate data collection for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer people uh, to inform health interventions. And I'll be speaking a little bit more about that today. And another example would be long wait lists to access publicly funded healthcare. The role of the health professional as an advocate, and often health professionals are working one-on-one -on -one with a patient, is to determine and understand the needs and speak on behalf of others when required, and to support the mobilisation or the use of, re of resources to effect change. 
I think some of the most powerful advocates that I've seen are certainly young people. Um, and I'm sure many of you um, either know young people or have participated yourself in advocacy, and that might be um, climate change, for example, or it could be sexual consent laws or transgender health or raising the age of criminal responsibility. And I'm sure you'll recognise many of the young people um, in, the, in the images here. So what strategies can you use to advocate for improved health equity? So advocacy strategies may include using high quality research, which is what we all do, highlighting individual stories with compassion. And I can show you an example of that um, later on in my presentation building relationships with members of the medical community, building a coalition with like-minded organisations, lobbying governments and politicians, and also engaging media to promote your key messages. Successful strategies should establish aims and objectives, frame the issue, so for example, changing policies and practices or arguing for funding or resourcing, and advocate for solutions. I think it's always important to try and think of um, the solutions. And the strategy may include vision, aims and arguments, exploring the problem and potential solutions, devising a timeline and an action plan, building your networks with key players and implementing an action plan. And I think it's also really important to evaluate your efforts, otherwise you won't be sure whether or not you have been successful. And there's a little map there on the right um, as to developing a, um, a, an advocacy strategy. So I work in a couple of different areas at the university, um, and one is gender and sexuality diverse uh, young people in particular, and the other area is vaccination. And um, I decided that I needed to advocate for, um, for, for my goals, and I'm just gonna share some of my goals with you today. So my goals were to extend to my knowledge, understanding and expertise and networks within an international context. I've done quite a lot of national advocacy, and I thought, oh, I really wanted to to um, advocate at an international level. And I was very lucky and I received a scholarship from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in order to um, pursue my advocacy goals. And my goals were to positively impact the health and wellbeing of LGBTQ plus people with a particular focus on young people, to gain an in-depth knowledge and understanding of the United Nations Human Rights Council and international advocacy. I also wanted to work towards the elimination of cervical cancer and other human papillomavirus related diseases in Australia and globally through timely gender neutral vaccination. So that's vaccination for all young people and to work to enable equitable vaccination across Australia and significantly to lower and middle income countries using both standard and innovative vaccine um, technology uh, delivery systems. So the United um, Nations Human Rights Council, some of you may have heard of that, it's an intergovernmental body within the United Nations system, and it's comprised of 47 member states. It meets at least three times per year in Geneva and Switzerland, and it's mandated to strengthen um, and promote the global protection of human rights and to address human rights violations and situations of concern. And it's a subsidiary body um, related to the United Nations General Assembly, which is um, located in New York City. So um, one of the things that I wanted to advocate for was the importance of a human rights approach to data collection for LGBTQ plus uh, uh, people in particular. And my advocacy um, for improved data collection for LGBTQ plus people promoted a public health and a human rights approach. It contributed to the development of a tool known as the 2020 standard. And I've got an example of it there on the right. If you Googled standard for sex, gender, variations of sex characteristics and sexual orientation variables, that would come up um, under the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And indeed, they developed um, this tool. And the tool was developed in consultation with LGBTIQ plus communities and it's considered best practice. Currently, we don't understand how many people identify as LGBTIQ+, where they live, or important information about their health and wellbeing, and um, people are not asked. That data at the moment wasn't collected adequately in the previous census, and hopefully that will change in the future. So this is of serious concern, particularly given the health inequities experienced by LGBTIQ plus people. I'm going to play a little video for you of my... Um, 
oral statement at the United Nations Human Rights Council about data collection. Uh, just a bit of background, I had a maximum of two minutes to speak. I had to stick to a script that I had to um, hand in beforehand and I wasn't allowed to depart from that script. So, and I'm speaking to the, um, the president of the United Nations um, Human Rights Council. So let's pop that on for you now. Mr President, the Human Rights Council of Australia and our co-sponsors thank the independent expert for his report on data collection. Substantial evidence demonstrates adverse mental health outcomes, including suicidal behaviours among LGBT people. In Australia, suicide is the leading cause of death between 15 and 44 years of age, and young people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity are overrepresented in these statistics. Yet significant gaps in our understanding remain. It is critical for Australia and other states to implement a human rights-based approach to data collection. We call for questions about sexual orientation and gender identity in the Australian 2021 Census, population-based data surveys and all administrative data sets, such as in health services data. We also call for national and jurisdictional support in Australia for the development of SOGI standardised agreed indicators for sexual orientation and gender identity which should be undertaken proactively with relevant experts and SOGI civil society organisations specialising in health. We wish to highlight the importance of relevant diverse SOGI population groups participating in data collection, analysis, disaggregation, self-identification, transparency, privacy and accountability. It is critical that SOGI indicators are included alongside age, indigenous status, ethnicity, cultural background, socioeconomic status and so on as standard demographic data subject to appropriate consent. SOGI indicators must be carefully devised and not inadvertently invalidate experiences of people with intersex variations or trans and gender diverse people. States will benefit from understanding more about the prevalence and experience of people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity and in turn systemic practices can be implemented to improve mental health and educational outcomes. Thank you. Um, something else that I've advocated for is also uh, to reframe public debate around LGBTIQ plus young people and their participation in sport. And in addition to um, undertaking research and publishing um, peer reviewed academic articles and writing articles in something called The Conversation, so you could um, Google my name and find out some of the articles that I've written and I'm sure some of my colleagues have written articles as well. I um, co-produced and wrote Well Played Young, Proud and Active. And it was a campaign to engage LGBTQ plus young people in sports and physical activity. And um, I did that for an NGO, a non-government organisation that looks after LGBTQ plus young people in, um, in New South Wales, and it's called 2010. So LGBTQ plus young people experience multiple barriers to participating in sports and physical activity. Um, so for example, exclusion. And I was really pleased that, um, that our campaign and the short video, which I'm going to show you soon, was the recipient of the Positive Media Award um, from Pride in Sport in 2020. I had also been commissioned by the Australian Sports Commission with a small group of researchers to design resources for sporting organisations across Australia to support the implementation of guidelines for the inclusion of trans people in sport. And you can see that down, um, down here. Um, you can Google these and see some of these resources. And our research report gained to play and academic articles from this research project underpinned this work. So everything I was doing um, was based by really strong evidence base. So what do young people want? This is what we found in our report and um, in our academic articles that were, were published as well. So young people wanted for organisations to provide non-binary options on sporting and leisure organisation registration forms instead of just male and female options. They wanted gender neutral facilities in sporting and leisure clubs and access to safe facilities. They also wanted mixed teams that are grouped on different categories, such as ability rather than sex and gender. They wanted outreach, sexuality and gender diverse outreach programs from accepting and non-discriminatory sporting organisations to help create safe spaces. They also wanted casual sports that are not based on competition, but based on social networking, inclusion and significantly having fun. They also wanted staff, coaches, and other people who provide and manage sports provision to take necessary action against homophobia, transphobia, 
and related discrimination. And um, I'm going to show you now uh, the video that won the, um, the, the prize that I was talking about, about engaging young LGBTQ plus young people in sport. Thank you. Since transitioning, my anxiety has been really bad. I almost felt like it would be unnatural for me to be gay and play rugby. I was just this little kind of nervous 19 year old and didn't know where I fit in in the world. It's mainly been about the way that people perceive me and, and sort of me having to change the spaces that I occupy. When I'm lifting, everything else goes away. Sport for me is just really, um, it's like an emotional release. And for that moment when you're lifting something heavy, that's all that matters. I don't really think about any of those other nervous thoughts that I have in my head. If I'm having a tough day at school, I can always remember that I've got AFL training afterwards or I'm playing an AFL game with my mates. This year, I feel like I play maybe a bit better and I'm more free and I like it. I enjoy it more because everyone's calling me by Jackson, the name that I really wanted to be called by, and that makes me feel like more like a boy. I started Derby maybe three or so years ago. was really interested in it, but just thought initially I'm never going to be able to play a sport like that. It's, it's physical and I'm just not coordinated enough. I started dancing when I was around about two or three. I love to dance because of all the passion and you get to meet new friends. Dance didn't exist. I would be actually dancing at home or in the shopping centres. Joining the convicts was actually a way to get back to a sport that I loved after having come out. The best thing about playing for the team is definitely the people. The kind of gauntlet you go through every Saturday, it brings everyone closer together and you make such amazing friends. For someone that identifies as non-binary like myself, I sometimes feel like I don't like the way I look or yeah, my body dysmorphia or dysphoria is um, really crippling sometimes. And so being in sport has helped me realise that it's not really about the way I look, it's about the way I treat my body and how I perform and what's going to help me in the long run um, live a long, healthy life. As I felt more confident, it kind of embraced a new side of me that I don't think I did get to embrace before Derby. It allows me to have a space in which I do feel powerful. It's also really nice winning. <laughs> Dancing actually makes me feel really free because I'm just in my body that I want to be. When the adrenaline kicks in and I forget about the nerves, it's an indescribable feeling. You can be trans, you can be girls, you can be boys, you can be a lesbian, you can be gay. It doesn't really matter because everyone can learn how to dance, everyone can learn how to do other sports too. There will always be something for you, you know, it doesn't matter how weird the sport is, doesn't matter if you're playing Quidditch, <laughs> you know, there's always going to be something that's going to help you get moving. 100% you have to do it. You'll make such amazing friends, it'll keep you fit and healthy, and also you'll get involved in a much larger community of just amazing people. Well, I would just say give it a go, see if your mate's playing any sport, maybe you could play with them, and once you give it a go, your confidence will build up and you might become really good at the sport. Somebody tell me please Why am I feeling weak? You can't seem to hold me It's about being able to play your game Eyes that he left for me Covered in honesty Why can't you let us just be? I think that safe space that Derby gives me allows me to take up space not only at Derby but in society and not feel like I'm constantly apologising for being who I am and existing. Such a cool feeling to know what your body's capable of. Just an incredible thing to be part of. When I play footy, yeah, I do feel like myself and I can be myself. I just feel free. I think it's really important for everyone to just be themselves and, and chase your goals because life is short and it's way too short to pretend to be someone that you're not. Thanks so much, everyone. I'll stop it there. But you could see that little advocacy um, at the end too. And I'm going to hand over to Joyce. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Katie, Kelly, Imogen and Christine for sharing the presentation. They were all great and I hope you enjoyed them as well. I'll just quickly move on to the next 
part. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to um, pop them in the Q&A um, segment and we'll go through them one by one. And while I give everyone a chance to do that, um, one of the questions that a lot of students come to us with is, I enjoy studying PD Health PE in high school. Um, what are some of the things that I could do at uni? And open to everyone. Um, I can kick that off if, if you'd like, Joyce. Yeah. Um, well, certainly within our school, um, which is part of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, um, we would welcome you to come and do a Bachelor of Education in Health and Physical Education. So you become a PDHPE teacher, but also you um, get a second teaching area. So students do everything from um, Aboriginal studies to history, English, um, and or uh, science or math. As a second teaching area, um, you could also do a primary education degree, but also you might want to just do a general arts degree um, and focus in your honours or in postgraduate work um, on, on issues of health and society. You could join Kristen and her colleagues in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, you might be interested in under, undergraduate degree in public health, or we also have a Bachelor of Exercise and Sports Science. Um, I don't know if others want to add to that. I can jump in as well, I suppose. Um, if you were to um, come and study a Bachelor of Arts, for example, um, in sociology, which is my home discipline, there are a number of different ways that issues of health equity or some of the um, different areas that you touch on in PDHP are taken up, for example, in um, sociology of the body is one of the units we teach as an undergraduate course that delves into sort of how we make meaning around what it means to sort of live in a body in society today um, and it sort of en encapsulates some of the experiences like Imogen was discussing of marginalised bodies and health and illness in society um, and there are a number of modules like that but um, that's how um, would probably approach it in sociology. Excellent. Thank you so much both for your answers. Um, I'll give everyone a chance to type in your questions, the Q&A once again. Um, one of the things that also come up is in terms of resources. So say someone was doing health equity as part of the HSC and wanted to prepare for their assessment tasks. What are some resources that you would suggest that they have a look at or some um, specific examples of that. Holly, are you happy to um, suggest some resources? Well, I think I always say that, um, you know, our stage six teachers are fabulous resources um, and that most of your teachers will sort of point you to specific resources that that help um, you know support your exams and things, um, but also of course um, the organization um, Achper, um, their website. They often have really good resources, and then also just doing your own sort of searching for specific niche topics. Um, and if that means contacting us in the panel for ideas, um, then I, I know we'd all be happy to receive those. Excellent. Thank you so much for that offer. I'll, I'll move on to the next one. So we have a newsletter that we have for high school teachers and students, and we would love for you to sign up. That was part of the um, evaluation form as well. And here are some of the next um, articulate talks that we have coming up. So the first one is for modern history, wartime diplomacy and China's status as a great power on the 31st of August. And also you can also scan the QR codes and have a look at the previous articulate talks and also some learning resources that we have curated as part of this program. And that's it from us tonight. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And a massive thank you to our wonderful presenters, Katie, Kelly, Imogen, and Kristen. And of course, Charlotte for all her background work and support. Thank you so much. That would be the end of today's Articulate webinar. Hope you all have a lovely evening.